Hey, what's going on everybody? Jared Maynard back, and it's been a while since I've recorded one of these videos for our Clinical Athlete YouTube channel, so I figured I'd hop back on here. This particular video was requested by my man, Michael Velasquez, what's going on buddy, um, who asked if I could record this video and just rehash, I guess, one of the topics that we had originally for our one of our Instagram Q&As, and the question was, what makes you any different from personal trainer? And the you is in reference to healthcare professionals who don't use much or any passive interventions as part of the treatment styles. As I go here, I've got a bunch of notes here on my computer that I had originally written for the Instagram Q&A. So if I'm looking down, please forgive me. It always bugs me when people read off the slides, so I'm going to try not to do that, but please love me anyway. Um, so before we get into this, a disclaimer, this is not meant to be in any way disparaging towards personal trainers, coaches, or any other professional for that matter. We're all on the same team, or at least we should hopefully be, and we're trying to work towards serving our clients in the best way that we can. And this question was originally brought up in a conversation with my friend Jackson Taylor, who we just recently had on the Clinical Athlete Podcast talking about character and why character and integrity count. Um, if you haven't listened to that, I would strongly recommend that you at least consider listening to it. It's one of my favorite conversations that we've had on the podcast so far, and I think that the the topic is a really important thing for anybody to, to think about on a personal level, but certainly for us as coaches, trainers, and clinicians. Um, so give that a listen. But Jackson and I were talking about <clears throat> the frustration that can arise when people who say that clinicians who don't use manual therapy or other modalities or don't use much of them um, are essentially just glorified personal trainers. And you know what makes you any different from a personal trainer if you don't use those particular things? So also as a disclaimer before we get any deeper in here, if I say PT, I mean physical therapist. If I want to say personal trainer, I'll say it in its entirety just for clarity's sake. So if you watched many clinicians practice, you may not be able to tell the difference between them and a personal trainer. They may have, might have no or very minimal hands-on work. They might be focusing on active interventions or training. They might emphasize communication and patient education. And it should also be stated that we're kind of talking about or this implies that we're talking about this sort of outpatient MSK, neuro MSK type population, um, just because comparisons with other populations, uh, patient populations probably don't work. So we're not talking about people who are in hospitals, people who are immediately post-op, people with neurological conditions, just because it's more likely that people in these populations are working with a healthcare professional or PT as opposed to a personal trainer. So for this conversation we're talking about the ortho stuff. So going back to that idea of, you know, if you may not be able to tell the difference between some clinicians and personal trainers, I think you're right. Um, in terms of interventions, at least the ones that are easily observed from across the room or on social media for that matter, um, there doesn't appear to be a ton of differences between a PT or a chiro or AT or other healthcare professional and a personal trainer. Um, secondly, why? Is that a bad thing necessarily? Why do we need to differentiate ourselves? Um, as a matter of course, it seems like that shifts the focus away from the question of what's going to build my patient's self-efficacy the most and help them get back to their meaningful activities the best and to the greatest extent, and shifts it towards something like, how can I do something impressive um, that no one else can do as part of rehab to differentiate myself? This brings it back around to Jackson, Jackson's podcast again, because we talk about, or rather he talked about that very thing, you know, where it ceases becoming mostly about what is best for this person in front of me, my, my client in this case, uh, and it turns into something like, well, what can I do to make myself seem cooler or more important? Um, and this discussion isn't meant to be a discussion of manual therapy or modalities directly, because that could be its own thing. And we have an entire session of the Clinical Athlete Journal Club dedicated to discussing manual therapy and a bunch of discussions in the forum discussing manual therapy and modalities. So check those out if you're interested in those conversations. So what exactly is different between a PT and a personal trainer, right? Well, we've got things like title, schooling, accreditation and regulatory bodies, scope of practice, and perception by the general public. So licensed healthcare professionals are licensed. The titles that they use are protected by law. They have stricter standards to get to get and remain licensed. Um, you have to answer to a regulatory body. The schooling's longer, it's more thorough, and there's a broader scope of practice 
although the scope of practice will depend on the legislation uh, specific to the profession we're talking about and specific to the location or where that person lives. So you might ask the question of who's better suited to work with clients, and that's probably case dependent, but remember that we're on the same team. So having a network of healthcare professionals, students, trainers, and coaches, <laughs> clinical athletes, <coughs> who are on the same page and can work synergistically to help clients is probably the best way forward, I think anyway. If someone is dealing with notable injuries, symptoms that are beyond what they can manage or tolerate, or if they're coming out of surgery, or if they may have ongoing medical conditions or comorbidities, then that person should probably be working with a healthcare professional. Um, these are things that are within the scope of practice, usually, of a healthcare professional. Again, depends on the professional we're talking about. Um, if someone doesn't fit those criteria, but rather wants to get in better shape, um, improve performance and things like that, then maybe a personal trainer or a strength coach would be a good fit. Or as another option, maybe the person, the client, they've started off with a rehab professional and they're at a point now of being able to manage themselves well, but they want to continue to train, um, then maybe it's a good idea to get them out of the medical setting and have them work with a trainer or a coach. I think, again, the key here is being able to have every professional in that network being able to talk to one another. So the PT, Cairo, AT, RMT needs to be able to talk with the trainers and coaches and plan for discharge from rehab and get input on the trainers and coaches on what would be an important thing or important things to start working on in rehab. And the trainers and coaches need to be able to talk to the rehab professionals if their client is having issues that seem weird or outside of the scope of practice. So you know, I've been fortunate enough to have two really good friends of mine who are strength coaches, shout out to Tori Yeager and Nick Koo, who have tagged me in to work with a number of their clients. Sometimes it's a one-off, you know, patients having, or the person's having these particular issues, they want to get my opinion to see if they're okay to keep doing what they're doing, or if they need to alter things a bit more drastically. And other times I've just been tagging along for the ride, you know, giving my my input along the way, if it seems like a, a situation where I, it would be useful to just kind of stay in the loop. Um, but the intent has always been to make sure that the client can keep doing what they want to do with their particular coach. Um, I'm just there to try to help navigate that and give it another perspective, you know, another another source of input. So that's what I got to say about that. Um, hopefully, hopefully this this conversation or this video ends up being somewhat useful to at least somebody. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of us have been part of this conversation or have heard this conversation willingly or unwillingly. Um, but again, I think that so long as we're approaching this from the perspective of recognizing that we're all on the same team or we should be on the same team and that our highest priority should be um, making sure that the clients that we're serving are in fact well served and that we're prioritizing their self-efficacy and autonomy and overall well-being now and in the future i think that's a good place for us to be all right everybody thanks for listening uh, and we'll catch you in the next one see ya